This is the electrical section of the InterNACHI Home Inspection Standards of Practice course. And again, this is a supplemental video, and we recommend opening the video in a new window and playing along uh, as you go along through the course content. Um, so right now we're in the electrical, and this is an exciting section of the course. So let's begin. Get a cup of coffee, and here we go. So the evaluation of the electrical supply and systems it's fairly complicated because it covers so many areas. It also poses potential hazards to the home inspector and often highlights defects that could endanger the home's occupants. So please stay safe and get trained and certified as much as possible. Please take the InterNACHI free online how to perform residential electrical inspections course and the free online advanced electrical inspection training course. And all of InterNACHI's online courses are nationally accredited by the National Accrediting Agency of the U.S. Department of Education. Always keep safety in mind. Be safe. Stay safe out there. Protect yourself and your clients by getting the proper training on electrical inspection and equip yourself with the appropriate safety gear, personal protection equipment. So please take InterNACHI's free online safe practices for the home inspectors course. A home inspector is not required to remove the dead front cover off the electrical panel. Doing so could be fatally dangerous. We do not recommend removing the front cover to view the distribution wiring or the components inside any electrical panel. It's not required by the InterNACHI Home Inspection Standards of Practice. What is required according to the standards of practice? Well, let's go over them. There's a lot. The inspectors shall inspect the service drop, the overhead service conductors and attachment point, the service head, gooseneck, and drip loops, the service mast, service conduit and raceway, the electrical meter and base, service entrance conductors, the main service disconnect, panel boards and overcurrent protection devices, that's circuit breakers or fuses, service grounding, bonding, a representative number of switches, light fixtures, receptacles, including those observed and deemed to be arc fault circuit interrupters, AFCIs, using the AFCI test button where possible, and all ground fault circuit interrupter receptacles and circuit breakers observed and deemed to be GFCIs using a GFCI tester where possible, and for the presence of smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. So let's go over some terms and identify certain parts, particularly related to the service. Now the word service is used a lot by home inspectors, and service is a term to describe the conductors and equipment for delivering electricity from the utility company to the wiring system of the house. So service is, in my mind, the main electrical equipment coming from the telephone pole or the electric company, utility company, to the house. That's service. And only one is typically installed for a house and a minimum of 100 amp service is needed for a single residence. Now take a look at this inspection image. There's a few parts, components of this area. There's a blue arrow, white arrows, orange arrows, and red arrows. Let's go over them and identify them so, you, so that you're using proper terminology during your inspection and within your inspection report. The service entrance cable, SEC, that's the blue arrow, arrow right there. So it's pointing to the SEC, the service entrance cable. And that's that line that's, for me, usually attached to the side of the house, on the outside of the house, and it goes right into the top of the meter box, right? And that's the line of service conductors, which are identified by those white arrows. So there's three of them, three big black cables. And they're located between the terminals of the service equipment, that's the main disconnect um, at the electrical panel, uh, near the, it could be near the meter or the electrical panel, that's the main disconnect, and a point usually outside the building, clear of the walls, where they are joined by a tap or a splice, and that's the orange arrows there. So the orange arrows is that connection, and it's a connection to the service drop or overhead service conductors from the telephone pole, let's say, from the utility company, and that's the red arrows there. So going backwards, from the meter that's below 
the service entrance cable here, SEC, the blue arrow meter. Imagine it coming up, service entrance cable. That's the line of conductors. Those white arrows are pointing to the conductors located between the terminals of the service equipment, which is the main disconnect, let's say, and a point usually outside the building where they're joined by a splice, the orange arrows, to the service drop or overhead conductors, and that's the red arrows. And the blue arrow is pointing to a protected or sheathed SE service entrance cable. And there's where I pay particular attention. I want that cable attached well and in good shape. Sometimes very old SE cables have that cloth sheathing on it and it's deteriorated and that would be a defect. The service point is the point of connection. That's that splice. That's the orange arrows there. Between the facilities of the service utility, the utility coming in, the service coming in, and the house wiring. So that's the service point. And that's at the drip loop too. The overhead service conductors, those, those three black wires there, the white arrows are pointing to them, are also the overhead conductors between the service point, splice, orange arrows, and the first point of connection to the service entrance conductor, and that's the blue arrow. So that's the, the service, um, the white arrows, the overhead service conductors are also forming the drip loop, and I'll pay attention to that connection as well, or that form. We want that nice drip. So that water, essentially water, doesn't travel down the what? The service entrance cable, SEC, blue arrow. Um, the service equipment is, usually, is the necessary equipment, usually consisting of breakers, circuit breakers, switches, and fuses, and their accessories connected to the load end of service conductors to a building or a designated area. And they're intended to constitute the main control and cutoff of the supply. So the service equipment is all the equipment. Let's scroll up a little bit. Consisting of circuit breakers, switches, fuses, and their accessories connected to the load end of service conductors to a building or designated area. And they're intended to constitute the main control and cutoff of the supply. It is understood that raceways, fittings, and enclosures housing service conductors are also part of the service equipment. Now the meter socket enclosures are not considered service equipment. The meter enclosures don't have any interrupting ratings or disconnecting means or over overcurrent protection. Grounding and bonding. Generally speaking, the difference between grounding and bonding is grounding is the direct connection to earth to aid in removing damaging transient over voltages due to lighting. And the purpose of bonding is to ensure the electrical continuity of the fault current path, to provide the capacity and ability to conduct safely any fault current likely to be imposed, and to aid in the, over, uh, and to aid in the operation of the overcurrent protection device. So that's what grounding and bonding is. Grounding for removing damaging transient overvoltages due to lightning and bonding to ensure the electrical continuity of the fault current path and to provide the capacity and ability to conduct safely any fault current likely to be imposed and to aid in the operation of the overcurrent protection device. Properly bonding, bonding, properly bonding all metal parts within an electrical system helps ensure a low impedance fault path. Now the issue of grounding and bonding is very confusing to many inspectors, even me. Due to complexity, we highly recommend taking the free online how to perform residential electrical inspections course. Remember, this is the InterNACHI Home Inspection Standards of Practice course, designed to teach a student about the standards of practice, not intended to teach you how to perform an inspection. AFCIs, they were developed in response to a need for equipment to sense when an arc fault was occurring. A combination type arc fault circuit interrupter should be installed to protect um, all branch circuits that supply 120 volt single phase 15 and 20 amp outlets installed in family rooms, dining rooms, living rooms, parlors, libraries, dens, bedrooms, sunrooms, recreation rooms, closets, hallways, and similar rooms or areas. There's a lot of rooms. And as a home inspector, I'm very cautious in testing AFCIs. 
without first informing the homeowners that I'm going to do so. I simply do not want to um, make a mess out of things like things that are on and need to be on, like computers and sensitive equipment. GFCIs. They're designed to sense any difference in current between the supply of the ungrounded hot conductor, the black wire, in a circuit, and the grounded neutral conductor, the difference between the two. Since the 1970s, GFCIs have been required in an increasing number of damp and wet locations, and more recently, this requirement has extended to all receptacles in the garage. Because they are safety devices, the home inspector should check every installed GFCI circuit and may advise the client of areas where they should also be fitted. So it's a good idea as a home inspector, and I did this as well, to inspect every home without any regard to the age of the home. So if it's a 100-year-old home, we're not going to find any AFCIs or GFCIs. But you'll find in my inspection report those recommendations. Because without these two safety devices, people can get hurt. So if it's a brand new home, 10-year-old home, 30-year-old home, 100-year-old home, I, as a home inspector, make recommendations to keep people safe according to modern building standards. I'm not a code inspector, but if there's a missing GFCI, for example, in the bathroom, I don't care when the house was built. Um, I don't use the word grandfathered anywhere. And I don't need to be a code inspector in order to recommend um, that G a, a GFCI circuit be installed or a GFCI device to be installed in a circuit where I think it should be. So it's a good idea. According to the standards of practice, the inspector shall describe in your inspection report, the main service disconnects, disconnects amperage rating, sorry, if labeled. So if you have a main disconnect at the panel, um, first of all, you're not required to test it and you really shouldn't. Um, if it's not labeled, mm, I wouldn't guess. You could look at the um, labeling on the breaker panel, uh, circuit panel, distrib distribution panel, the main panel. Um, there could be other clues elsewhere. But if it's not labeled, that's OK. You don't have to identify the amperage rating. The inspector shall describe the type of wiring observed. And there are several different types of wiring. There's common wiring, too. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But you should take the electrical course to train yourself on identifying the types of wiring. Here's an inspection image. It's of a 150 amp main service disconnect. And the amperage rating was observed. And the inspector described the rating in the inspection report. So I think this inspector used one finger for 100 and a half a finger, bent finger for 50, so it's 150 amp panel. Two fingers, two full fingers would be 200 amps. In this inspection image, the type of wiring observed during the inspection was described in the report. The home inspector described the type of wiring as non-metallic cable. Most circuits in the modern North American home um, and light commercial construction are wired with non-metallic sheathing, NM cable, designated type, often referred to by the brand name Romex. That's a brand name. This type of cable is the least expensive for a given size and is appropriate for dry indoor applications. Many people use the name Romex when referring to the type NM cable. But Romex is a trademark name that has come into common usage for referring to plastic covered wires but type NM just means non-metallic and also applies to other cable styles. Type NMB, non-metallic sheathed cable, may be used for both exposed and concealed work in normally dry locations at temperatures not exceeding 90 degrees Celsius with opacity limited to that for 60 degrees Celsius conductors, as specified in the National Electrical Code. NMB cable is primarily used in residential wiring as branch circuits for outlet switches and other loads. NMB cable may run in air voids of masonry block walls or tile walls where such walls are not subject to water, dampness, or moisture. Now, home inspectors are not code inspectors. Yay. The code book is huge. This isn't the code book, but I have it somewhere here. It's about this big. And if you're a code inspector, you're, you're supposed to be able to just pop right in there and identify that code and try to refer to it immediately and apply to it. We are not code inspectors. 
Home inspectors are not code inspectors. In some areas, um, especially in regulated states and provinces, you're not even allowed to say the word code. But InterNACHI's online training and certification and continuing education courses are all based upon a standard, a truth, and that is code, building code, international residential code, plumbing code, energy codes. Um, uh, so that training that you get, the knowledge you get from taking InterNACHI's courses, they're all based upon code and standards and practices. You can apply all that knowledge as a home inspector in a general manner during your home inspection. So again, electrical inspections can be fairly complicated, especially in the case of older properties where there may be a variety of systems and wiring types, some of which would not meet current codes. However, home inspectors not pre perform code inspections. They're only required to evaluate the condition of systems and report observed efficiencies that pose a danger to the property or its occupants. Home inspectors should inspect the house without direct reference to the age of the house. For example, and that's because, going back, that's because code is highly dependent upon date. When the home was built, when is the home being built, and what modern codes are being applied by the local authority having jurisdiction. Is it the 2015 code? Is it the 2018 code being applied to this new home? And when homes age, well, homeowners typically don't know the code iterations when things are improved and they don't install things until there is some kind of transaction or a renovation or an upgrade or a home inspection. So it's a good opportunity to help people stay safe and protect the property. Now, for example, GFCIs and AFCIs were required by construction standards and residential codes at various times in the past. Because a home inspector is not a code enforcement officer or a code inspector, the home inspector need not concern him or herself with when the GFCIs should have been installed or not installed in the house. If a home inspector observes a lack of GFCIs in the house, that's a defect. That should be reported by the home inspector. Another example would be smoke detectors. Code requirements for smoke detectors have changed in the past over the many years. Years ago, only a few detectors were required in a house. Presently, there are many areas in a house that smoke detectors should exist, regardless of whether the home is newly built or 50 years old. Smoke detectors, just like GFCIs, saves lives. Pay no attention to grandfathering excuses provided by homeowners, contractors, or real estate agents. Let's take a look at the inspection process related to the electrical system. It's ultimately up to the home inspector to develop their own inspection process the initial steps of the inspection sometimes starts outside with an inspection of the service supply from the utility company's equipment. The inspection then may follow the attachment to the house structure, the service entrance cables, the electric meter, the main disconnect, and the connection to the main distribution panel itself. The objective for the home inspector is to check everything that is readily accessible and observable and to document indications of observed deficiencies in the components of the electrical system. Visual inspection of the service panel or panels may come next in the process. A home inspector is not required to remove the electrical panel's front cover, called the, the dead front, from the accessible main panel or any other sub-panels. If the inspector decides to exceed the standards of practice and removes the cover, the inspector might look at the condition of the panel, breakers or fuses, panel interior, and the attachment of the branch circuit wiring, and determine what the materials are that is used inside the electrical system. In some cases, the inspector may find solid branch aluminum circuit wiring that may require further evaluation by a qualified electrician. You may find that there were renovations at the house and newer wiring installed by homeowners, which would result in a condition that may be unsafe. All electrical wiring should be conducted by an electrician and inspected to meet current codes, and that is far beyond the scope of a home inspection. According to the standards of practice, the inspector shall report as in need of correction, deficiencies in the integrity of the service entrance conductor's insulation, drip loop, and vertical clearances from grade and roofs. The inspector shall report in, as in need of correction, any unused circuit breaker panel opening that was not filled. There should be no openings there. If you stick your finger in there, you get electrocuted. The inspector shall report as in need of correction, the presence of solid conductor aluminum branch circuit wiring, if readily visible. The inspector shall report as in need of correction, 
any tested receptacle in which power was not present, polarity was incorrect, the cover was not in place, the GFCI devices were not properly installed or did not operate properly, any evidence of arcing or excessive heat, and where the receptacle was not grounded or was not secured to the wall. And the inspector shall report as in need of correction the absence of smoke and or carbon monoxide detectors. Here's an inspection image above here of an inspector touching the service entrance conductor and checking its condition. You can also see the grounding wires. Overhead wires. Overhead wires from the street should be higher than 10 feet above the ground, not in contact with tree branches or other obstacles, and not reachable from nearby windows or other accessible areas. The wires should be securely attached to the building and have drip loops where they enter the weatherhead. Wires should not be located over swimming pools. Solid conductor aluminum branch wires. Well, they were installed in houses primarily in the 1960s and early 70s, and they are a potential fire hazard. According to the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, fires have been caused by the use of aluminum wiring in homes. Now, what are you not required to inspect? Well, according to the standards of practice, there's a lot. The inspector is not required to insert any tool, probe, or device into the main panel board, subpanels, or any fixtures at all. You're not required to operate electrical systems that are shut down. You're not required to remove panel front ca uh, cabinet covers or dead fronts. You're not required to operate or reset overcurrent protection devices and overload devices. You're not required to do it, and you really shouldn't. You should never do that. You're not required to operate or test smoke or carbon monoxide detectors or alarm. Just required to inspect for their presence or absence, reporting on their absence. You're not required to Inspect, operate, test any security, fire alarm uh, systems or components or other wiring or signaling systems. You're not required to measure or determine the amperage or voltage of the main service equipment if not readily labeled. You're not required to inspect ancillary wiring or remote control devices. You're not required to activate any electrical system or branch circuits that are not already energized. You're not required to inspect low voltage systems. I, I do the doorbell. After many years of doing home inspections, people call me up for missing the doorbell. I just inspect the doorbell anyways, but you're actually not required. The inspector is not required to verify the service ground, inspect private or emergency electrical supply sources like windmills or solar panels, you're not required to inspect spark or lightning arresters, inspect or test the icing equipment, you're not required to conduct voltage drop calculations, you're not required to determine the accuracy of labeling. All the breakers should be specifically labeled. Not required to inspect exterior lighting. I tend to inspect the, the front lamp if it's out there. And certainly not any decorative lighting or landscaping lighting. So in all cases, the electrical inspection is a visual one. And the inspector should not put him or herself or the client in any danger while inspecting the house. So to that end, the inspector is not required to insert any tools or measuring devices into any panels. Systems or circuits that are turned off at the time of the inspection should not be re-energized as they may have been shut down due to existing faults and problems. Operating breakers, disconnects, or removing fuses is not recommended as this can disrupt operation of the homeowner's electrical devices including clocks, alarm systems, and computer equipment. Low voltage systems need not be inspected and are excluded from the standards of practice. Such systems are al alarm equipment, intercoms, some lighting circuits, doorbells, and irrigation systems. Similarly, lightning arresters, power generators, and any electrical storage devices like battery backs are excluded from these standards, as are swimming pools and exterior spa systems. Some inspectors have received special training to evaluate these systems, and they charge accordingly for those ancillary systems that are beyond the scope of a home inspection. While the inspector should report obvious deficiencies in labeling of fuses and breakers, you are not required to evaluate every circuit and its labeling for accuracy, nor is it possible to fully evaluate hidden systems such as grounding rods and their continuity. It is also well beyond the scope of a home inspection to give an opinion as to the adequacy of the electrical systems to support future usage. And that is the electrical section of the International Home Inspection Standards of Practice.